Well, good morning, Facebook family. I am Pastor Dustin Bloomer, and you've joined us for Peace Through the Pandemic. We are in the book of Colossians, and I hope this finds you well. And I wanted to ask you, who are you willing to fight for, and what do you want for them? Who are you willing to fight for? Now, when it comes to my life, I am willing to fight for my kids. Um, willing to make sure that they have good things for their lives, and so what it means that I fight for is certain rules of the household. For example, if you're part of the Bloomer team, uh, you will do chores. <laughs> Just ask my kids. Uh, hi, Brian. Uh, because we want them to understand the value of working hard, um, the value of responsibility. In, in the Bloomer household, hi, Marianne, uh, we are willing to fight for a good attitude. And so rolling your eyes and tone of voice, uh, that will be uh, disciplined uh, because that's not how we talk, especially to those in authority. Uh, we're willing to fight for that. Uh, we're willing to fight for contentment. And so that means uh, even though I would give them the world if I could, um, not everything is beneficial. And so it's not always good to just give them whatever they want all of the time. I think many parents are willing to fight for their kids. And uh, I, I was reminded of a Facebook post I saw earlier this morning um, from a friend. It says, if you haven't yelled, stop doing that, we can't go to the emergency room right now. Are you even a parent? And isn't this true? Like uh, with them at home, you have to, again, establish some order um, because of the situation. This past year, I uh, had a chance to listen to a wife who fought for her husband. This woman had come to the knowledge of the Lord and saw his splendor, his beauty, his glory. And since that moment, uh, prayed for her husband to find the Lord as well. And she was telling me that she prayed for 15 years, for 15 years, praying that her husband might know the Lord, fighting in prayer. And it worked. He found the Lord and now is leading her in what it is to follow Jesus Christ. And, and what a wonderful thing to fight for, to fight for those we love and to fight for their faith. Well, we are in the book of Colossians, and that's exactly why this book is written. Paul has never met these Christians. It was a church started by Epaphras, and yet he's willing to say, you're my brothers and sisters in the faith, and I'm going to fight to make sure that you know Jesus Christ, that you're not swayed by any false teaching, which is why he writes the book to, again, counter false teaching, and that you might be in heaven forever and know the peace of Jesus right now. Colossians chapter 2 says, I want you to know how much I am struggling for you and for all those in Laodicea, for all who have not met me personally. I'm going to struggle so that you might know the Lord. Maybe not praying for 15 years like that one wife, but, but sharing the truth of God's word. What he wants them to have is the full riches of complete understanding that they might know the mystery of God, namely Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. He wants them to understand the Lord and, and what the Lord has said. Now, the first thing he does is describe that Christ is a mystery. In fact, in, in your walk with the Lord, are there ever times where you have unanswered questions? Times that you wrestle with him and still don't completely understand? I remember being at seminary and uh, one paper I wrote was about the hidden God. Isaiah says, surely you're a God who hides himself, O God and Savior of Israel. And so to completely understand everything about God, that'd be like trying to drink Lake Michigan a glass at a time. We're unable. He's too much. In fact, during Holy Week, I was reading from the book of John, and he says, you know, so much more happened that, that isn't recorded here. And that's true about our walk with God. But hidden in him are all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Basically, Jesus reigns supreme, and he is enough. And while we can't know everything, what are some of the fun things you've learned in walking with God? I remember learning about the omnis, omnipresent, that he's everywhere all the time, omnipotent, that he has all power, omniscient, that he has all knowledge. That's pretty cool. But my favorite thing is learning about agape love, the love that Jesus has authored, the love that says, 
I love you because I love you. Not based on your performance, but based on my decision. I love you based on the performance that I gave for you on the cross. Agape love means I have a love that's never going away. The only way it goes away is I run away because it's always there for me, not conditioned on my performance, conditioned on Jesus Christ. How wonderful. Good morning, Sandy, Linda, John, Janice, Hannah. Um, isn't that the greatest thing to know about our God, his love? Which is so different than the way the world loves. It is not reciprocal based on what we gave him. Rather, he loves us because he loves us. What better thing is there to know? And so Paul writes in order that they might know what Christ has done for them uh, based on what's going on. And, and he says, See to it then that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the basic principles of this world. So what he's fighting for is that they not be led astray by false teaching. In fact, many of Paul's letters are written so that we would not be led astray by false teaching. And it reminds me of today, how much false teaching is going on. And I would say out of love, if you have a framework of theology that's built solely on Netflix and the theology of Netflix or their references to Christians, you might be led astray. If you have a theology based only on your conversations with friends who maybe have a beef with church or maybe even burnt by the church, I would say your, your theology might be faulty. In fact, let's just go over some of the, the different uh, false teachings that are out there so common. I find at least four that I want to talk about with you to be aware of. One is the teaching of universalism. The idea that it doesn't matter what path you take in order to get to God, whether you call it Mormonism, whether you call it Islam, whether you call it Judaism or Christianity, they're all paths up a mountain and God's at the top. And that's a fine sounding thought. And I think people say that in order to give respect, and, and, and respect is always good to give. But consider what Jesus said. And this is not a pastor. This is just Jesus. When the disciples asked about the way to heaven or the way to God, Jesus said, do you remember these words? I am the way and the truth and the life. No one gets to the Father except through me. Now, he, he wants sincerely everyone to come, but you can't take just any road that you want. I am the way, says Jesus. Another common teaching is prosperity gospel. That if you believe enough, you'll get almost everything you want. In fact, I remember reading a book by a pretty famous author. And the premise was kind of like, if I just pray hard enough, I'm going to get the parking spot I want and the job I want and the situation that I want and the house that I want and on and on and on. And all I have to do is believe. And then I think of like when Jesus was warning his disciples, if anyone wants to come after me, you must deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. So, so you're going to be persecuted. All people are going to hate you because of me. It's going to be hard. You're going to have to be willing to give up all things, as Paul talks about uh, being in plenty and want, and that's the way of Christ. So the idea that I can just believe enough and everything's going to go my way, it's a false teaching. And when things aren't going our way, and, and we thought that, maybe we might question God. There's also the, the social gospel, the third that, that the job of a believer is just to make the world a better place. We are to cure all disease. We are to solve all poverty. We are to use our life in order to make this world not broken anymore. And I remember when Mary Magdalene gave perfume to Jesus and, and people were wondering, should this really be used? You know, because you could, you know, serve the poor with this big amount of money, this big gift. And, and Jesus said, the poor you're always going to have. And we should help them. Today I'm going to go get a gift card for someone who reached out online and needed some groceries. That's good. But are we ever going to solve all the problems of our society? No. But probably the fourth and the catch-all for false teaching is Jesus plus something else equals my salvation. As Lutherans, we grew up learning about the Reformation. 
And what was very clear is that the theology of the time was Jesus plus your indulgence equals your way past purgatory into heaven. And, and that's what the Catholics taught. They built St. Peter's Cathedral from the money of indulgences. Uh, and, and yet it was never in the Bible. Jesus plus indulgences or Jesus plus your penance. In fact, if, if maybe you're from the Catholic background and you hear, a, you know, Jesus did his part, now you have to do your part, and that's what leads you to heaven, that's a Jesus plus theology. Or sometimes it's Jesus plus your decision. Um, you know, Jesus did his part, now you have to make sure you've decided right, and, and that's what's going to get you to heaven. And so there are people wondering, well, did I decide, and did I pray the right prayer? And some who've prayed the prayer 20 times and hoped that it took. Jesus plus. What Paul was writing about was a Jesus plus salvation. And what was being taught to, to those in Colossae was Jesus plus circumcision. That some Judaizers has come in and said, you know, to really be a Christ follower, to really be good with God, you need uh, the, the, the old covenant. So Jesus plus your circumcision will get you to God. But there is no Jesus plus. There's only Jesus. And so Paul reminds him. He says, In Christ, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. And in him, you are circumcised in the putting off of the sinful nature, not with the circumcision done by human hands, but the circumcision done by Christ. So basically, uh, if you have Christ, you have the only necessary circumcision, that of faith. And by the way, he reminds us of how we started this thing. In verse 13, it says, When you were dead in your sins... And in the uncircumcision of your sinful nature, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave your sins. So proper theology on how to be saved and get to God is about dead people coming to life spiritually. Now let's talk about, you know, what dead things can do a little bit. Um, sometimes I refer to a dead squirrel. And so I'm going to ask you some questions um, based on our dead squirrel. Um, what can a dead squirrel see? Nothing, right? Okay. Uh, can a dead squirrel run after cars? No. Uh, can a dead squirrel get nuts and, and, and hide them in a tree for later? No. Uh, can a dead squirrel ask a girl squirrel out for a Friday night date? What can a dead squirrel do? Nothing. When, when God is saying you were dead in your, your sins, he's basically saying you could do nothing. You brought Nothing. There is no decision. There is no action that you could make as a dead thing. But what changed? God made you alive. Awesome. Maybe someone shared Jesus with you. Maybe your parents baptized you. And through that, through what God did, God brought you salvation. And so true theology is not Jesus plus it's just Jesus that saves us. To make that more clear, he goes on. He says, he canceled the written code with its regulations that stood against us. He took it away, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the powers and authorities and triumphed over them by the cross. So the written code that was given to us were the commands of God. Do this and don't do that. And if you do it right and perfectly, you could get to heaven. And if you uh, break the law, you deserve punishment. And, and we could never keep them. We could never do enough or not do enough. We've sinned by sins of commission and omission, the things that we shouldn't have done and did or should have done and didn't do. But God reminds us, he took that away, nailing it to the cross. When Jesus died, he said to Telestai, it is finished. And instead of do and don't do, the only word that matters now is done. Your salvation is done through Jesus Christ. It can never be a Jesus plus your works, Jesus plus your decision, Jesus plus anything. It is only Jesus that saves you. How awesome. And because of this, you have peace. Paul said the authorities were disarmed. So if the devil is the accuser pointing a gun at us, trying to get us accusations of what we did and didn't do, you need to know he might have a gun, but he has no ammunition. Because it's all done through Jesus Christ. He cannot accuse us anymore. How wonderful is this? 
the truth of the gospel. It's all done through Jesus and he took dead things and made them alive. That's you, that's me. How great is his grace and his agape. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, today, let me understand the peace of what it is to have my salvation done completely through you. Thank you for choosing me before I could ever choose you. By someone sharing Jesus, by baptism, Lord, help me to fight for the faith of others in my prayers for them, in sharing the faith, in teaching truth. Lord, bless all gospel ministry and other pastors sharing this truth that others might finally be led to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, thanks for joining us today. Uh, may God grant you peace. It's all done um, because of Jesus. And we'll see you tomorrow. Thanks. Bye, guys.